Hey guys, this is Tony. I'm going to be going over the delta delta today. So delta delta is a concept in um, acid-base chemistry of the kidneys, and um, we're going to talk about it in a way that is easy to understand, and hopefully you'll get something out of it. So the first thing is um, you have to have done the delta delta happens after you already have determined that the person has some sort of metabolic acidosis. This is key. You have to have a metabolic acidosis before you do these calculations with delta delta. On top of this, you have to have also an anion gap in order to do a delta delta. It does not make sense, as I will tell you later, that um, to to calculate a delta delta when you do not have an anion gap. So there, these are your criteria. You have to have a metabolic acidosis. And then you have to have some sort of anion gap. Those are your criteria. So let's say you found out that your patient has metabolic acidosis. So if you have metabolic acidosis with an anion gap, let's talk about this anion gap first. So usually in your, an your anions, these are your negative um, charges, you have um, an area which is going to be your anions. So um, these are going to be your um, mixed fixed acids. And then you have a, another area that's going to be your bicarb. And then the rest of it is going to be a chloride. So an anion gap is this. It pretty much tells you how much fixed acids you have in your blood. So what is a fixed acid? So like fixed acids are things like um, lactate or um, beta hydroxy, hydroxybutyrate, things like that. You can think of it as COO minus. So when you have an, a metabolic acidosis, it means that your bicarb is less than it should be. So that's why you have a metabolic acidosis. And anion gap says that your fixed acids are bigger than it should be. So if you have a metabolic acidosis with the anion gap, it has to mean that you have gained fixed acids. Your anion gap is too big. It means that fixed acids are too large. So how does that happen? Well, I mean, there are lots of ways that this can happen. One way is going to be lactic acidosis. And there are some drugs that cause lactic acidosis. So like, for example, um, metformin can cause lactic acidosis. So also you have um, ketoacidosis. What is ketoacidosis putting in? It's putting in ketone bodies. It's from um, metabolism. That's your beta hydroxybutyrate. And then there's your lactate. So when your anion gap is high, it has to mean that you have added some sort of fixed acid. But um, some, sometimes this is not the only problem. Some of these patients not only have a lactic acidosis and a ketoacidosis, but on top of that, they have another metabolic syndrome on top of that. So I'm going to just draw a, a little thing and just say, like, a, this person could have a metabolic acidosis or a metabolic alkalosis on top of their initial metabolic acidosis. So let's say you have figured out that you have metabolic acidosis, so they have an increase of fixed acid. But on top of that, they also have another problem. And their other problem could be a metabolic acidosis, and, or it could be a metabolic alkalosis. So let me just go through some examples. So the example is metabolic acidosis. How can you get um, a metabolic acidosis? Well, one way you can get it is um, if you have too much aldosterone, right? So if you have too much aldosterone, 
to little aldosterone, hypoaldosterone. Hypoaldosterone. Remember, in your athlete intercalated cells, you have this pump. It's a super hydrogen pump that is going to um, excrete. This is your blood side. This is your lumen side. If you if you have aldosterone, aldosterone will enhance this pump. So you can get rid of hydrogen from your blood if you have aldosterone. But let's say this pump is gone because you don't have aldosterone. Well, then all that hydrogen is going to build up in the blood. So for example, hypo hypoaldosteronism would give you a metabolic acidosis. So let's talk about some reasons why you would have a metabolic alkalosis. Well, in a metabolic alkalosis, you could have, um, let's say, a vomiting. Vomiting was a good thing. Uh, you're, you're puking out all your hydrogen ions. Um, how about another way you could do is like um, in acid use. So if you had a lot in acids, you're adding a lot of bicarb into your blood, and then that would also give you um, an alkalosis. So all of these... So what, you were, uh, what I'm basically saying is that when you have a metabolic acidosis, you can have a secondary metabolic acidosis caused by another reason, like hypoaldosteronism. So like this person might have two problems. They might have a lactic acidosis on top of a hypoaldosteronism, or they could have um, a ketoacidosis on top of vomiting a lot, a lot. He might be diabetic and then he might be vomiting from some drugs. So he might be metabolic al acidosis and on top of a mel metabolic alkalosis. So the point of this is to um, understand how to use that delta delta to really determine whether you have two things or you only have one. But, well, you, it, it's, it's pretty, yeah, or, or you have none. Or it could just be a, a a plain um, metabolic acidosis. So the other thing is nothing. You just have a plain metabolic acidosis. All right. So let's go over this. So um, I'm not going to talk about delta delta or like delta gap just yet. I'm going to teach you about um, the different concepts that you must know in order to solve this in a really easy way. I, this is going to be a two-part video. I'm going to be teaching what the concepts are, and then the next one I'm going to teach you how to solve problems using a three-step process. So first thing. So in order to find your anion gap, you have to realize that your positive and negative ions are going to be um, equal at all times. And the best way to do this is to, um, to notice that sodium over here and, and your anions, your anions are going to be your fixed acids, once again, and then your bicarb, and then your chloride. So um, in order to solve these, normally what you'd have to do is you'd have to take your so total sodium and then you have to subtract it from your bicarb and your chloride. These are values that you get from your patients. They're, they're directly from the blood. So what you can do is you can take your sodium concentration minus um, your bicarb concentration plus your chloride concentration. So you're basically looking for this over here. This is going to be your anion gap. So let me talk about this anion gap. So your anion and gap are fixed acids. So before I have to, before I keep on going with this, I, I need to show you an image of um, your proximal convoluted tubules and your glomerulus. I'm just going to blow it up really, really big. OK, is this going to be your proximal convoluted tubules over here? It's a bad picture, sorry. So um, what happens is your blood is kind of going around here. Um, there is a bunch fluid that moves in, and one of the most important pumps that are in the proximal convoluted tubules is this um, hydrogen pump, and you have to know this hydrogen pump because it, it serves two main roles, and I'm going to talk about these two main roles of this hydrogen pump. First thing is that 
when your fluid, when this urine, this pre-urine, this is your serum, uh, serum, comes into your proximal, proximal convoluted tubules, you have ions in them. So one thing is that you have your, um, your, your fixed acids, they have negative charge, and then you have your bicarb, which has a negative charge. What this hydrogen does is that it comes in and then it whacks this bicarb. So this bicarb, there's no pump that pumps this bicarb back very easily. The best way that your proximal convoluted tubule restores bicarb is whacking it with a hydrogen ion and then it can become something more soluble, which is going to be HCO3, and then it becomes CO2, and then once it get, becomes CO2, it can diffuse right back into your proximal convoluted tubules. So that's function number one. The function number one is for hydrogen to, um, to hydrogen is used to reabsorb bicarb. That's function number one. Function number two is to neutralize that negative charge. You have to keep all your ions equal in each of the compartments. If you have a fixed acid in your proximal convoluted tubules, you need to make sure that that carboxylic acid is going to be converted into a carboxylic acid that is protonated. So this hydrogen has a second role, which is going to be um, neutralize fixed acids. And these two things compete with each other. This is a very important idea. So it, when these two compete with each other, I'm going to tell you that this one wins. So if you have more fixed acids in your blood, if there's more fixed acids that's going to be traveling into your convoluted tubules, the hydrogen is going to bind on your fixed acids first. What does that mean? Well, I mean, if you're binding on fixed acids, obviously you can't bind it onto your bicarb. If you can't bind it to your bicarb, what do you think is going to happen to your bicarb in your blood? Well, of course, it, w it would decrease. So if your fixed acids increase, the amount that you could possibly absorb through bicarb is decreased. So let's go back to this image over here. So once again, you have a fixed acid. What happens, let, let me just draw this a little bit bigger so that you can see what's happening with these anions. If you have HCO3 over here, and then you have your fixed acids over here, chloride over here. If you had a diabetic acidosis, which means that you have increased the amount of fixed acids, what will it be in place of? Well, according to this over here, this, this image over here, it has to mean that if you increase your fixed acids, it's going to take up space of bicarb. It doesn't just push it down. It actually, it, for all you can say, it, like, it pretty much consumes the hydrogen that is supposed to be used to restore your bicarb. So now your bicarb is less. And what do we call that? We call that a metabolic acidosis. This is your first metabolic acidosis. Now the question is, what happens if you, um, if you had another problem on top of that? Like uh, I told you before, you had like the hypoaldosteronism, you can have like in acids and everything like that. Well, those things don't really affect I mean, it does not affect your fixed acids. I mean, if you take an acid, do you think that's going to add um, things like lactate? I mean, fixed acids are like lactate and like um, a beta hydroxybutyrate, 
I mean, are, are, are antacids going to affect that? Of course not. Of course not. And, and acids are going to be affecting bicarb. So an acids is going to affect this compartment over here. So what, what do you think is going to happen if you increase the amount of antacids in your blood? Well, I mean, if you add the amount of antacids, well, obviously this compartment will increase. So let me just draw it in a way. So this is your number one. This is your metabolic acidosis. And then now you have two cases that you can have. So let me just take this over here. So you already have your primary metabolic acidosis, and now you're going to add another problem on top of this. So right now, this I want to give you an example of vomiting or in acids. These affect bicarb. So like, what do you think will happen if your bicarb increased? Well, bicarb is not going to affect your fixed acids because, as I said up over here, that the priority is made to fixed acids. So what it does is, is that it takes over the compartment of chloride. So if you have um, a bicarb over here, the bicarb will shift it down like that. But what if you have hypoaldosteronism? So if you have hypoaldos, another color, hypoidose, then you're going to be acidotic. So if you're going to be acidotic, that's going to consume the amount of bicarb that you have. So just by knowing your bicarb, just by knowing your bicarb, you can determine whether this person has some sort of metabolic acidosis, but you cannot figure out what the person has secondarily to the first metabolic acidosis unless you did this calculation. So the next video is going to focus on how to use this in answering questions.